Okay, we're here with some Q&A time. So, let me fix it. Sorry, I, I didn't get my green screen up. I got Bailey with me again. Oh, that's open. Close the app. Um, so, we have a lot of questions asked by you guys. Let's be cracking into them here today. So let's look in a book. You have questions and you need answers, Lindsay? I can't help you with Strongman. That's Martinez' job. Okay, um, you have a question, K Sera Sera. Daniel's got a question. So I've got some questions already generated by you guys. Before we jump into them, um, let me just kind of like, I guess, set up the format of how we're going to do this. So I'm going to probably start a new campaign real quick. And we're not going to play through the campaign. Um, I'm going to actually, I'll, I'll load up one of my uh, Sun Jian campaign and I'll use it as a talking point about certain aspects of your questions. So do not ask your questions willy nilly. I will miss them. I promise. Um, I've got a list of questions from that from the post. I'll go through those real quick, to the best of my ability, um, and then I will answer questions in like a Q and A format after that. Um, so let me load up my uh, Swinjian campaign. I was playing Leo Bay last night. Uh, tip number one, turn on Chinese voiceovers. If you haven't, that's your first tip. First, let's get the real reason you guys are all here. Come here. Come here. Oh, you are so sleepy today. Yeah, Cao Cao is, is honestly probably the hardest campaign <laughs> as far as like the, the intro campaigns go. It's pretty damn hard. When you look at like the very hard and hard ones, it's a lot different, of course, but those are the ones that are hardest, Bailey. Okay, so let's get cracking. Right, pop, pop. Right, pop, pop. Oh, big dog ears. I know you just want to play. You just want to play. Don't stream down. Just play. What's up, Josh? How are you doing, dude? Uh, no, I'm not streaming all day. Just probably for about an hour or two to get some questions answered. Um, I got some stuff I got to make for the channel. And then we'll be doing a, um, a stream for Warhammer. Oh, dog. Okay, so let me look at this list of questions. This list of questions. So, I'd like some discourse on army composition. It feels like there is much less depth to battle compared to Total War Warhammer. Seems like you basically always want to have a strategist because range is just so good, and you don't want G infantry because of how easily arrows dispatch them. Do G even beat out spears? Is there any reason to bring them over sabers or spears? So, let's jump into army composition real quick here. Uh, Sun Jian is a, uh, is a sentinel, and this army is actually not that good. Um, I kind of just did it based off of what I had access to to begin with in the game. And to be totally honest, hello Ren Renzi, Fu Renzi, Renzi, Frenzy. Um, I wouldn't really make a game uh, a, a, what's it called like this? Uh, so Sun Jian is a sentinel. I've got Huang Gai as a champion, and I've got Sun Tzu as a vanguard. Now, I actually really like these two as a whole. Uh, Vanguards, I think, are extremely strong. Um, you really want to be mindful of what their bonus, this character's in specific bonus is. If I were to redo this army, uh, this is the very first campaign I probably played through. As you can see, it's it's in a number of bad positions. Oh my god, my allergies. Um, but if you take a look at the military of a strategist... They get our they get access to archers, mercenary archers is part of the uh, Sun Tzu's ability. He also gets access to ooh, you have your crossbowmen at rank six. So when you look at the reforms tree, um, you get access to from Lu Bo Liu Bo, you get access to repeating crossbowmen, followed by uh, Wei Qi, which gives you access. Uh, yeah, Wei Qi, which it gives you access to heavy repeating crossbowmen. 
Now, these two units completely melt mid to late game things, and archers as a whole melt early game things. In my experience, you want four to six archers in your retinue, either spread across, in all of your retinue, spread across one to two characters, however you want to do it. So, let's say you're playing uh, Liu Bei. Liu Bei gets access to archers like right out the gate. So his Yi Marksmen are extremely good, and I would get them as fast as you can. Um, commanders can sometimes recruit them. Liu Bei can recruit them as part of his uh, faction mechanic, I guess you could say. But I would really try to focus on having a strategist in your army so you get access to archers. Now, one other portion of a strategist that's really strong is this ability, right? No. Well, that is a strong ability. Uh, where is the one for flaming arrows? That, there it is. Uh, composure gives you... Uh, flaming arrows now also they've got cunning now the way cunning works is that it gives increased ammunition for all of your archers in their retinue so if you fill archers in your strategists retinue then they have a much more increased ammunition pool because they naturally have the highest cunning out the gate um, you can have vanguards or sentinels with high cunning you're not relegated to only the strategist having high cunning but strategists innately have that now, as far as G infantry, so here's some G infantry versus, say, spear guards. Oh, we can take a look at these two by hovering over, turning on comparison mode. I unfortunately can't move my cursor up there, um, but you can see 39k health on spear guards versus the 19k health on G infantry. Now, when you're also looking at spear guards, you're looking at about 60, what is this? Back, old morale versus 52. So you're thinking, why the fuck would I ever want? G infantry. Is that a literal research tree? Yes, a literal research tree. Okay, uh, Sarasra. Good point, man. I will definitely do that. So, the biggest advantage that, say, G infantry has, though, is their armor piercing capabilities. Their melee is also really high. Where's their AP? Uh, armor piercing is 28 versus a spear guard. Oh, it's 31? Man. You'd think I knew what I was talking about, but I swear to God they had really high, because halberds are usually really strong in this game. They must have changed that in a, in a build, so I, ap I apologize for that, sounding like it was false information. But their base damage is way lower because they're spears. G infantry as a whole are just very well-rounded troops. Um, you can't go wrong with them. When you ha compare them though to specialized troops like spear guards, yeah, spear guards are going to be really, really good at taking out cav. But as you can see, because their base damage is so low, they're not as good as at dealing with um, assaulting units. When you take a look at, say, Jean Sword Guards, Jean Sword Guard are supposed to be better at frontline and assaulting units. Um, you can take a look at this roll. It'll say frontline roll. Axes are typically the like premier assault unit. Um, and each one of these kind of have a specific role, right? So all, roll, all-rounder, roll, anti-cav, roll, frontline, roll, assault. So a G infantry can do all three of these things well-ish, but, oh, good good point, uh, Kalsir. I guess I'm, I'm looking at these stats thinking that they're full unit strength and they're not. So I should probably wait a turn or two before I start comparing things. But my point at the, long, at the end of the day is G infantry allows you to fill more roles than specialized units versus spear guards are not going to be good at say assaulting units or um holding a flank as well as say uh the g infantry stuff like that so you use these these units in accordance to what you're going to be or what you want to do as a commander i personally stack as much cavalry as i can if you can't if you can't notice over here um i think that cav is very strong in this game and just because you've got cav assaulting spearmen doesn't mean they're going to lose you have to look at light medium and heavy as an indicator of what's going to beat what so these are medium spear halberd and sword and this is light sword cavalry um, for the most part they will do the job for light to medium a he heavy spearman or heavy halberd will counter them quite quickly and quite well i hope that kind of answers things the army composition i would have in mind is um, a full retinue of cav a full retinue of or at least a half to, if not a complete full retinue of archers, and then a good mix of spears and swords in another one. Um, champions are very crucial in my mind because they're very good at dealing out a lot of damage and winning, important, winning duels. Sentinels are very good at lasting through duels. 
Um, you'll notice that a lot of their objectives will sometimes be last this long in a duel or beat the opponent within a certain amount of time. Sentinels are good at being able to outlast your opponent that you can then retreat from without having any penalties. If you're, say, like a champion who's meant to kill an opponent and you jump into a um, jump into an engagement then and you retreat from it without winning, you more often than not will in, in, um, incur some penalties. But again, Calcium made a really good point. I was looking at comparing these units when they do not have full strength. As their strength increases, their, their stats will as well, especially their hit points, of course. Um, let me take a look here. My question isn't on 3k exactly, it's more a general Total War question, since I'm still fairly new to the series. When do you become, when do you be, or when do you become aggressive, expand new territory, and when to make your second or third armies, etc.? I've been told that armies shouldn't be made to sit and defend territory. Um, yes and no. I would say that armies shouldn't be made to defend territory solely. True. I do think that, um, how do I feel about the Dong as a lord? Can't go wrong with the Dong. I feel like um, armies should be made initially to hold a border and then expand it. So what I mean by that is, if I were to raise a brand new army, I would probably raise it in a fringe, like out here by Changsha Trade Port, if I, exp if I plan on expanding out this direction. So while I'm building the army, I at least have a vanguard on my outermost territory. And this is not like a, like a trick of the trade, this is just the way I play Total War games. Um, a lot of people... Uh, like to make their um, their innermost territories their primary military territories. It's however you want to build your military buildings up, to be totally honest with you. Um, you want to always make your military in buildings that have... I'm sorry, you want to make your army in whatever commander you has your military buildings, so you get the advantage of stuff like... Um, so if I take a look at conscription, plus three starting rank for all recruits in local armies, and that's local to the commander. So... When you're building up your armies, make sure you have them in places, obviously, where you have military buildings. Um, as far as when to build one, that's, I guess, a pretty that's a pretty open-ended question. It depends on your economy and how it's growing. Obviously, I would not make one right now. My army upkeep is very high. My salary is very high. I'm having a negative income per turn, so I would not do this now. In total war Warhammer, I would say if you're if your day if your uh, per turn income is over fifteen hundred, your economy is at a good point to to sustain a second army for expansion. In this game, I could say fifteen hundred was isn't a bad idea. It just really depends on um, um it really depends on sorry I was looking at chat there. It really depends on what your uh, situation is like because. Unlike other Total War games, your income can be very dependent on your your allies. So in the past, like let's say, let me zoom out here. Um, let's say Liu, uh, Liu Biao, let's say him and I had a trade agreement. And even if his cities were besieged, it didn't matter, I would still get income from them. In Total War Three Kingdoms, if something cuts off the direct path from your territory to their territory for trade, then you lose that trade route. And that's important because that then cuts off a portion of your income. So you have to be kind of very mindful and fickle with your income and, and realizing where the sources of it fr are from. Um, I think I don't have any that's coming from trade in this campaign. Yeah, I've got zero from trade. So I know my, my income is truly indicative on my own self-sufficient resources or my lack of income. So look at that a lot when you're, when you're kind of taking a look at that. Um, let me look here at chat, see if I missed it. Um, Kalsir, it's it's not so much that they're stats, but it is their role because... Um, so take a look at this. For instance, a sentinel will always innately be a little bit better at dueling simply because they are restricted... Well, I'm sorry, this isn't fair. They're restricted by their armor type and also their weapon type. So a champion has right here a base armor of 70. Let's take a look at Lufan. I think Lufan, nope. Who's got, someone's got a fancy robe on. Okay, so this has got a base armor of 20. If I put this guy in a duel, he's going to get cut up because he has a lower health pool to begin with because resolve dictates your uh, general's health. 
He's got a lower health pool to begin with. He's got a lower base armor to begin with. And he's limited by he can only equip swords. Now, swords aren't innately a bad dueling weapon, but if I take a look at one guy who is a champion, he can use all these weapons. Two-handed axes, maces, pole arms, and staves. Staves. Um, so the weapon doesn't necessarily say that he is going to be a bad or a good duelist, but the fact that he that a um, strategist naturally has lower resolve, thus lower hit points, and naturally has is, is limited to armor that has limited amount of protection means that in a duel he's not going to be as great as, of course, like the guy wearing Lady Sue here, who's Lady Wu. Sorry, Lady Wu. Who I mean, this has got a base armor of forty four. That's double the armor of your strategist. It just really depends. I mean, you can also argue that her resolve is low. Commanders and strategists typically aren't good fighting, whereas sentinels and champions are better in duels. Um, I've seen commanders that are good in duels. Like I think uh, Liu Bei has got a very high resolve um, and, a, and good armor because he is a unique character and he ha it's a role that he's had throughout history. So he's better in duels than other commanders, but I would still want uh, Guan Yu to fight my duels over uh, Liu Bei. Does that help out, Kalsir? Uh, Yuan Shuao, for some reason, his his uh, confederacy thing is super high, so he just confederates massively quick. That's where the meme comes from. Um, let me see. I what some of you guys are asking me about building optimization. I will definitely get to that. I so promise. Um, let me see here. This is another army thing. Um, if you do three K and answer my answer some questions. Could you please give some army building advice? It's really confusing, especially the yellow turbans, because some of them have a trait for range and melee, but can't recruit all of your unlocked infantry or range and everything is mixed. Also, the color stuff is kind of confusing. The yellow gives morale to your troops, so wouldn't it be the best to just stack yellow on everything except for strategists and champions? I don't know if I'm just too stupid to or optimize or if it's just so much freedom that you can do whatever you want with the general, like a 1v1 commander character. Um... So we already kind of went through army comp in the beginning. Hopefully you got some of that. Um, the color stuff is kind of confusing. Like yellow gives morale to troops, so you wouldn't it'd be the best just to stack yellow. Um, no, not necessarily, because you can also have, depending on your retinue, you can have... Where the fuck is it? I have Vanguards, I know, have it. You can have Unbreakable. Redstone. Disciplined. Does not suffer a morale penalty when the, when the general dies, which is very good. At least one of these guys had um, Unbreakable. Well, my point is that morale isn't that strong because you have so many other characters that bolster your morale. I mean, you've got three characters per army. So authority, while strong and good, is not necessarily that applicable because if you take a look, it only applies to your own retinue, not to your commanding force. So, stacking morale on every single character is not as advised. Um, we can take a look at a, at a champion. They have very high resolve, right? So, that's going to give them a massive amount of health. Um, stacking instinct on a champion isn't a terrible idea because they ha already have a naturally high resolve pool. You increase their instinct, you increase the amount of damage they do. Same thing with a uh, vanguard. Naturally high instinct pool. You can keep stacking the instincts to make them an even better character when it comes to shock having his way through things or stack his resolve so maybe he's a little bit better in duels really you have to stack the thing that makes the most sense for the character's role you have in mind i want sun Tzu to be really good at a, a shock cav disruptor on the battlefield not in duels so he's got instinct just chalked up his ass in addition i gave him this which allows him to have a uh, wedge formation for his cav so also, his retinue is entirely cavalry because his benefit is for uh, cav. Oh, that's faction Y, but still, it applies to him since he's the uh, faction heir. So, really, what I would focus on is the role you have in mind. So, if I had Lu Su in this army, I would stack cunning and I would put him in the back line and I would fill his retinue strictly with archers. About faction wide bonuses, which are active for leader hyper. Your tutorial seemed to suggest that it still works locally for administrators. Is that correct? No, Calcier, it is it is wrong. Um, it used to be, and I, I I went off of previous information. 
it used to be that these things um, would be to administered locations and they changed it during one of the builds. I've used multiple builds up to this point now. So unfortunately my information on that was a little wrong and I apologize, but it used to be that, okay, like Lusu, the administrator, he was an administrator because minus two construction, construction time, faction wide was not dependent upon him being minister, heir, or faction leader. It was him being uh, administrator. So that did change. And that's why I think even in that video, I said, this must be a bug, bug save or something like that. So I apologize about that, um, Halsier. No, it is not even if they're administrator. We got another question here I'll answer. Uh, tips on handling public order. Just got my first Imperial City and it says minus 30 for order. Unless I have a garrison there, it's going to always go down it seems. Also, tips on effectively using generals during the battle would be nice. Um, we can go through some tips on some battles. I don't think I have any close by to go through though. I might have to fire up another. I'll fire up my Ma Tung save to do that one. Um... Man, I am like really here. Let me do this. webcam, webcam. Why don't you fix my fucking face? Boop. There it is. A little bit darker, but at least I don't look all washed out. This question requires G Fuel, marketed for gamers by gamers with gamers. Got some in the closet right now. Did you did you find out the triggers for unique character events like Zhao Yun? Event for Liu Bei or Dian Wei for Cao Cao. It really bothers me how random those events are essential characters. Uh, so, you know I can't say your name. You know why I can't say your name. But I'm going to just call you Get. So, Get. Um, I think as long as you follow the story of your character, it says you'll have events that say this follows the story. It should present itself as long as the faction doesn't get eliminated. If the faction does get eliminated... You should be able to find any of their characters in the global recruitment pool. For example, Zhao Yu is in my global recruitment pool because he was dismissed, he left the, the parent faction, or the parent faction was destroyed. This will put him into the global recruitment, recruitment pool. Um, let me answer the question, though, on public order. So, opening up Changsha... Uh, as you expand your cities, you can see one thing keeps happening. We'll take a look at number one. Number one, you get prestige, population, reserve, and building slots, right? But as the question stated, when I made my first imperial city, I'm having so many problems with my public order. Help, 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 help. So, as you increase your cities, you will have a problem with, with your public order. Um, one, because of food production. You have to have a high food production to match the size of the city. And the point of that is because you're having a higher population impact. Um, when I look over, when I hover over this over here, you can see that the population for the commandery is 1.8 million. And you can see that there's two numbers, peasantry income bonus. It's got the white number of 100% and the grayed out number of 350%. So this is your current population level, which is the white, and the grayed out, which is the maxed out population level for that commandery. As you increase, I believe it's, yeah, I believe it's the maxed out for the commandery at level 10. So as you increase your, your, the size of your commandery and your population increases, public order, you get a natural public order penalty because you have overpopulation in those, uh, in those regions. So to balance that out, you want to look for government buildings. Uh, the administration offices will help out because they'll increase your uh, prestige and your income and all that. They'll reduce your corruption. Corruption is extremely important in the late game. So be mindful of corruption. Now, Confucian temples are your main focus for your public order. You always want to have some sort of public order building in your commandery because you need something to subvert the massive amount of public order penalty you're going to be having on your later administration buildings. Um, tax collection will not help out your public order. Be careful with that. Also, your reserves will help out your public order. So if this was at zero, then you would be dipping into your food production. And your food production, if that below, drops below zero as well, will drastically hinder your public order. So right now, my population has got a minus 10 to it because of, as, as a symptom of its current uh, population size. So in order for me to increase this, I have to do a number of things. Uh, I can make an administration office, or I'm sorry, a confusion building. 
uh, temple. That'll help out with this. Because it, of course, will increase my public order. You can keep in a, uh, a standing army in here. You can see I've got a garrison, so that helps out. Administrators will typically help out because you can... You can use stuff like... So this guy would help out. Oh, fuck. Some of these... Some of these have changed as well, because you see how this says plus two public order only if this character is prime minister, heir, or faction leader. A lot of these used to be inadministered commandery, so you have to find any kind of ancillary that says public order bonus to uh, administered commandery. I don't think I have any that are administered commandery, unfortunately. All right, guys. Yeah, I don't. So, um, that that is going to help out with public order significantly. Your ancillaries, um, you can have skills that help out with that. I think commander has a public order one. Yeah, here you go. Uh, stability for the for the uh, commander will help out with uh, public order. So and that's in the case that you make them an administrator. Um, also, sorry if you guys can hear that gigantic saw. Um, you will find public order bonuses through I think it's this whole line. Yeah. This line is uh, is your public order and corruption. This will help out with that because this is the only way you can get access to, you know, rural province administration. That and so on and so forth. I think the Confucian line of buildings will help out too. Let me find out where that one is. Ah. Yeah, the Confucian line will help out with public order as well. Because you're going to get public order from this actual reform itself. And you get the uh, access to the, the next line in the uh, Confucian buildings. This will help out with satisfaction and character salary. Which can help out in ways. Um, I'll answer another question here. But I got one in chat. Uh, if you have two generals that don't get along. Can you make them friends? So. Good question. But who do you not like? Oh, you don't like uh, Lu Ji. So, I guess we'll take a look at the port system. So, we can see by looking at these little uh, X's and exclamation or check marks who likes who, right? And Lu Ji and Sun Tzu do not get along. So, an, a good way to get them to get along is to put them in the same army. That is unfortunately one of the only ways that I know how to make them get along. Um, I know there are other ways, I just haven't really discovered them yet, and I can ask Creative Assembly for help on that, but another way is that you just hopefully get traits that, that bolster themselves over time. So let's take a look here. So I take a look at Sunjian. Sunjian's natural traits are these three. Brave, fiery, and loyal. Uh, Huang Gai, brave, uncomplicated, and intimidating. Sun Tzu is brave, arrogant, and fiery. So a lot of these kind of go well on hand in hand together, right? So, if you have two generals, and they have conflicting traits, you can put them in the same military, and because they be kind of come oath-sworn via battle, the relevant influences, battle, battle, opinions, opinions, battle, um, as you do certain things that play in well, play along with their traits, you can get additional influence with characters that typically don't have, uh, uh, they have disharmony as, as it is, right? So putting them in the same military force can help a lot. Um, on top of that, they will just they will develop traits over time. So this line delineates. I think it'll tell us right here, right? Each character has traits which reflect their personality. Hitherto, undiscovered qualities develop over time, revealing themselves as experience is as experience is gained. Traits have significant effects on a character's capabilities, their opinion of others, and behavior. So this line delineates between. Um, traits that are gained through the campaign and traits that are you innately have. And as you gain traits, those will sometimes create harmony with other characters. You have campaign events that happen that will help create harmony with other characters as well. Uh, let me see here. What do you think about replay value? All the starting positions are landlocked, unlike Warhammer. So you will be fighting most of the same foes in early to mid game after all. Um, so let's take a look at this map. I don't have anything to mark the map with, unfortunately. 
For the most part, the Total War Three Kingdoms takes place with Sun Zhan starting at the southernmost portion of her starting location, uh, Ma Tung over here in the westernmost, and Gong Sun Zan over here in the easternmost, and Eastern and Kong Dong or Kong Rong over here as well. Uh, those are like the two eastern and the western and the southernmost portions. Then uh, Zheng Jiang is up here in the northern, with uh, Huang Do as, as well. No, no, he's over there. Um, so, what of these two regions on the map? I mean, historically, Liu Bei in, in, inhabits here, and Sun Jian inhabits here, right? The Shu Kingdom. So, and Song Dynasty is up there, all that kind of cool shit. I think that right now, this is just the main portion that we're supposed to be playing. The Creative Assembly has talked about the chapters, and I'm hoping that the chapters talk about, you know, like the, the Samhan over here of Korea, uh, maybe something to do with Taiwan. I think in the future, we will get more starting locations that are, you know, variety there. There's more variety than in those replay value, or in that replay value. So we'll get access to start over here or over here or over here more so. But yeah, right now, you're kind of landlocked in the central Asian plane here, in the central China Chinese plane. And I think that's intended with the, the characters you have in mind and the starting point in history that Creative Assembly has in mind. Um, but the replay value, though, I think is extremely high. Ma Tung plays so much different than Sun Jian. And Sun Jian, as a, as a result, plays vastly different than Cao Cao. Cao Cao is way, way, way harder, in my opinion. Um, Cao Cao says, easy, recommended. I think that's fucking horseshit. <laughs> um, building optimization. We didn't go into that yet, but we will. Is there a building like the Armorsmith or Weaponsmith to get horses? <sighs> so there should be. Uh, I think... Horses get, are from uh, horse pastures, and I think horse pastures will also um, All right. a hot pad sometimes helps out my tight hamstring muscles. Um, horses, I believe, are sometimes generated from the uh, pastures. I'm Don't quote me on that, though. I, I have to look at it. Wasn't there supposed to be... Um, Andrew Wachowski, uh, Wachowski, Wachowski asked, wasn't there supposed to be starting time? I thought, remember, when this game was first revealed, we'd get different times to start, like before the coalition or later when it's just the big three. Um, Andrew, I believe that's coming from what I read in the, the chapters. They're saying that the chapter, the chapter DLC, I guess, will enable you to have different starting times and locations. Any tips on improving my war game? Um, we can jump into a war guys want we take a look here uh on total war on total war three kingdoms how do you get a faction that you vassalize or allied with attacked to how do you make a, a an ally or vassal attack is basically the question we go to diplomacy um let's just say that Cao Cao is my um bro Koshiate um, they'll also have a little icon. It looks like a circle with a little, it's like a, it's like a, a reticle with like a little point finger on it. Like this, the cursor, it's like that in there. Um, but you would go over here to war coordination, uh, select a target, remove a target, or zoom to target. You would just hover, you'd select the faction you want, press negotiate, hover over here, then press select target, and you can just choose on the map where you want them to attack. Um, so you can see that these icons all denote certain things. So I believe it's circles are settlements, squares are cities, and triangles are actual armies. So you can have them attack any of those, any of those points. Oh, baby, I have your way. So as far as building optimization goes, we'll go through that real quick, and then I'll answer a lot more from uh, chat. I'm so sorry if I've been missing out your questions in chat. Give me one more sec. My last question I've got written down. So um, 
building optimization. How should you go about that? Take a look at your commandery. What do you have in it? We have got a tea house, an armor craftsman, and a trade port. So we don't have any food production, meaning that our next expansion should really be somewhere to get food. Um, some of these things will create food, but not all the time. As we can see, none of this is creating food. Um, where is the, uh, the, we're surrounded by it. So rice patties will help out. Rice patties over there. I mean, we're, we do have a lot of food options around us. But you can always build out your irrigated farms, uh, building tree line, in your agricultural buildings. Right click here to get to the building browser. You can also press this button. Uh, but see, these are all grouped, right? Here, so here's like commerce and industry. Here's peasantry and uh, food production. Uh, this is various benefits such as trade influence, such as um, experience gain, stuff like that. I think this also does uh, commerce uh, building lines. Military buildings is self-explanatory. And then your government buildings are going to be your, of course, your taxes, your public order, um, anything pertaining to settlement administration for the most part. And then you'll notice that these colors will then coincide with the colors here. So T is going to give me peasantry income. No, oh, Bailey, you can't get on my bed. Uh, is going to get give me something that's benefited from this line of trees. Um, my armor is going to give me benefits that are benefited in this line of trees. And the same thing with this with the trade port. So, for instance, in this, Changsha, I have got a trade port. Trade port gives me income from commerce. So, I've stacked up the tea house, which increases... It, it gives me income from commerce, but also increases my income from commerce. That's how I optimize buildings in my settlement. Um, and this is really only uh, a level four city. Once I jump to level five, I can build a military building line, which I'll, I always like to do in um, buildings that I want to make my, my first initial capital. But if I hover over here onto the the income, I can see that my commerce is my highest amount of income here. So I stack those buildings that make the most sense to increase what I'm naturally getting the most of or what my commander has access to. Like if I had... This is a good one. If I had this commandery, uh, Yuzhong, I would, so this has got a rice paddy and it's got a livestock farm. I know that those are gonna be peasantry and food production focused, so I would focus on doing those. I would focus on using the green buildings. Going back over here, I would focus on the green buildings. Government support is going to give me higher food production and increase my income from peasantry. You'd want that line. Or you can branch this line off and take advantage of a higher food production and a lower income from peasantry. It just depends on what you want your commandery. Also, you can use land development to increase your food production only in your uh, provincial capital. But you can also, let's say you've got um, like a grain, a grain field, a, a farm, and then a livestock pasture. Well, you can really afford to sell some of that. So you can press, you can go down this line to get more income from your peasantry because you're selling the mass amount of food production you've got going for you. Uh, food production is extremely beneficial. I, I cannot stress it enough. If you do not have food coming in, your population will be very, very not happy. And on top of that, if you have low reserves, you will get a lot of penalties on top of it. Of course, public order being the chief one, but your higher your reserves, the longer you can last. Um, sometimes it increases your replenishment or your mustering. This depends on what the, the situation is. Okay, so that's the, all of my written questions. So if you've asked a question in chat, I unfortunately didn't see it. So let's go ahead and open that back up. Um, to ask me a question, mention my name, so at Italian Spartacus, and ask your question. It'll be easier for me to see it rather than me seeing just a, a bunch of text and hoping I see which one is a, is a question asked to the chat versus me. Um, Mountain asked, you mentioned Sao Sao is probably tougher than the game that's on. Which characters would you suggest to someone completely new to Total War games? Uh, Sun Jian. Sun Jian is probably, or Sun Jian is probably your easiest one. Uh, he starts right here. He starts with this commandery. And he only has to fight the Han Empire. For the most part, they're very docile or they have small uh, stacks to attack you with. So I would say focus on them. Focus on Sun Jian. It's a very 
uh, easy to get your feet wet campaign. You've got no natural enemies outside of uh, uh, Sai Mao and uh, Huang Zhu is what the, the game sends you to. But Liu, Liu Biao, you end up maybe fighting. Uh, but for the most part, this is all Han Empire around you. So it's very easy to kind of pick and choose your battles. Um, Major Mula asked, your most and least favorite things about the campaign gameplay so far. Most fa favorite is the depth. I really, really enjoy the depth of it. My least favorite are the extremely random circumstances that can really cripple you. You can have an army that's attacking a city just get at a random event that says your entire army gets five minus five morale for no reason at all. Or you might be in enemy territory and one of your characters gets captured and you have to pay like a 500 or 1000 copper uh, ransom to it. I don't like those situations. I think they're cool and they build a narrative, but it, it implies all my characters are at the whims of the game's RNG and I don't like that too much. I think that there should be, oh, your character's stupid, or he's a fool, or he's foolhardy. Then that should increase those those instances. But if your character's cautious, or he's aware, or he's brave, it should increase the likelihood of morale benefits, or them completely, like, um, maybe subverting a, a capture and thus benefiting him. Like, stuff like that. My, my mouth is getting caught in my beard. I gotta get my beard trimmed. Um, Daniel S. asked, how important is it to stick to a faction's playstyle, like Rapid Expansion, for example? Um, depends, Daniel. For Zheng Jiang, yeah, you have to stick to aggress aggressiveness or aggression or else your intimidation... Intimidation is not her. Uh, the thing that makes her, her, her tribute. Um, or else it won't stack for you. You need to be winning combat. Uh, same thing with Dong Zhuo. You have to make sure you are fighting and winning wars and not losing them. Uh, Sun Jian, though, you can be very passive. You can be very low to move you can be very diplomatic um Cao Cao, though you have to be extremely diplomatic you have to use his proxy wars it really depends on who you're playing as uh to really take advantage of or not take advantage of their preferred play style let's see uh crisps uh tickus asked i could use some direction on replenishment is it it's all about population um it's about population it's about ancillaries. It's about character skills. Um, one for, oh no, it's just, I guess I'm just thinking of instinct with recruitment cost. But their actual skills can help out with your replenishment. Your uh, followers and your uh, accessories can help out with your replenishment. You can have reforms that help out with replenishment, I believe. Where is it? Recruitment cost, mustering. Mustering is a set value. It's about so you, when you recruit a unit, it's about 15 or 20% health, and every turn, it will gain about 10% health. Mustering will will reduce that amount of turn, that, that turn time. That up, orange hat. Yeah, there's replenishment. There's one of them. There, there's other ones that do give replenishment as well, though. But... Replenishment does come down to population and military supplies. Military supplies will help out because you can see here, my total military supplies are 56. Um, I'm going to gain 32 at the end of this turn. And my current uh, effect from this is here, 2% replenishment. We'll go ahead and end this turn and I'll show you. I'll just, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'll choose anything. So, okay, replenishment's 2%. Um, we'll see how that affects this once this turn ends. Watch, something's going to happen and end the fucking campaign for me. And punishment might be the same. There you go. Got it, got it. Cool. Okay. Uh, so this would be... You want to shoot... Go to fucking hell, you want to shoot... So you can see here, the replenishment and morale doubled as we kind of jumped up over 80 military supplies. And I think it will go to 6% at 100. I can't remember. Uh, but hopefully, uh, Tickus, that helps you out. Let me know if that didn't and I can expand more. Uh, Andrew asked, how does the trust feature work in this game? How bad is it to break treaties and such? It feels like it would be a much bigger thing in this game. Um, it is pretty massive. You can It can affect their relationship with characters. And if it affects their relationship... And those characters are 
close allies to you, your own characters, like if they are diplomatic, they won't like if you break treaties. Uh, if they are trusting, they won't like if you break treaties. You have to look at the traits that this might affect. So, um... I don't think I have anyone here that's like... Loyal, I think. Loyal, I think it does it. Uh, focuses on family. Um, there's there's some traits that, like, if you were to break a treaty, they'd go, I don't like that. Uh, so you can see, like, with Huang Gai, his relation with me, with Sun Zhan, is for the most part positive. But you can see at the very bottom, we fought side by side in battle. We won, but lost many soldiers. So even if they're on your side, they can be dis they can disapprove of the way you do things if it doesn't coincide with their traits and specific. So you want to make sure that anytime you do a diplomatic action that is treacherous, it's treacherous against someone that maybe is already treacherous. Uh, you don't want to sit there and go, oh, I'm trustworthy. Let me go and fuck with... I'll just say Dong Zhuo. We all know Dong Zhuo is a dick. We all know Dong Zhuo is a dong. Um, I'm going to betray Dong Zhuo. Okay, well, so is everyone else of the age. So it's not that bad. But you will see that your trustworthiness is going to... Uh, increase or decrease based off of your actions. Hovering over actions that'll say uh, would be a sign of treachery sometimes will show you the the negative or positive uh, increase. But so you have to worry about your respect when it comes to dealing with other people. Because I think your respect also inflicts your trade influence. I can't remember. Um, but your respect also allows you to enable diplomatic uh, deals to happen a lot easier. Like, no one's going to want to sign a coalition with you if you're untrustworthy or you're treacherous. Cletus Andy's asked a really good question. Uh, does the garrison building only apply to the commandery capital or all, or all locations in the commandery? So, every settlement and then commandery capital has their own separate um, garrison dependent upon the, this building. And I think there might be another one for them. <sighs> yeah. So military buildings will also increase your garrison as well. The infrastructure ones. Yeah. So this will add to your garrison. Um, but so Imperial City will, will grant us crossbowmen, archers, Jean sword guards, spear guards, G-infantry, so on and so forth. Uh, this little bad boy, it, it just varies depending on what you do. will grant us, you know, lance cav, archers, archers, axe bands, so on and so forth. Now, if I take a look at the armorer, the armorer has his own um, garrison dictated by the levels of his or his settlement. So, my current level is level 2. This is the garrison he has access to. Once I progress him to level 3, this is the garrison he will then gain. So, garrison buildings only apply to the Settlement or commandery capital in which you build them in. Man. Sub's going wild. Thank you for subscribing, by the way, guys. So, see, again here, I'm just trying to exemplify that. And you can see your garrison by clicking the little shield with the silhouette. So, this is this building. I get all these goods. This typically denotes a second retinue. So, that's like two full retinues here, for example. But, as you can see here, you get all these goodies in uh, the coastal trading port. And then also, uh, for your administration capital, if you have an administrator in there, their garrison, their troops are part of your garrison as well. So you can actually field someone you want to make an administrator, put all the units you want them to have as like a garrison. Like, I think the best play would have been to make this guy... Uh, do this. God damn it. Raise an army. Choose Lu Su. Confirm. Fill him with archers. Then just put him back in the admin in the uh, capital to administer. Like or even because some some fact some guys have filled out um, uh, retinues. Even choosing one of these guys to have been my administrator, assuming they fit the needs I had in mind, would have been a good idea because then this capital then gets a bigger garrison, doubles their garrison just by that virtue alone. I don't know. I do not believe you pay the upkeep if you if you garrison a large garrison from a character. You only pay that character's salary. 
that makes sense. Did that answer your question? Hopefully, let me know if it didn't. Um, let me see here, give you some direction on translation. Andrew, I answered. Uh, tears. Are there... Tying events into traits is a fantastic idea. I would love that, right, Major Mula? You just answered. Need to add more weapons, armor, and horse tamers to the east side of the map. Some warlords won't. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. That's a good comment, Daniel. I actually haven't, I haven't ventured personally into the eastern portion. Uh, uh, so Andre asked, Andreas asked, um, Fosht asked. Um, another question about armies. Would you suggest a blue general with six archers slash crossbows, red generals with six cav, red and yellow, and a green general with six infantry, spears, swords, and axes? Um, yeah, yes, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Uh, you could, you could put less archers in your strategist and put more, uh, like one or two more units of, of infantry if you feel the need, but just take a look at the character you, you have in mind. So, like... Um, one guy. 15 charge bonus for spear infantry. Well, maybe I want to stack more spear infantry with one guy. Um, and maybe a little bit less sword and uh, axes. Okay, uh, Sun Tzu. Okay, well, I definitely know I want a lot of shock cab with him. Um, Lu Su. He doesn't, well, uh, I think Lu Fan. Xiao Yu. Retinue upkeep and morale when defending. Okay, so they don't have any specific... Yeah, yeah, strategists, those strategists did not have any specific benefits for units, and sometimes you won't find that on strategists or sentinels. So it just depends on what you what you want. But yeah, you could stack it like that. I mean, that's how the way the colors are supposed to work. I mean, you can see here, this guy's got almost all green. This guy's got almost all purple. This guy's got almost all red. So I kind of stacked them that uh, in line with the way that their uh, colors work, because militarily... They won't even be able to recruit anyone other than their their respective special units. Um, I'm Sun John, so I have access to all mercenaries, which is very nice. It allows me to um, focus on units that wouldn't normally be recruitable by the color or the uh, character class. As you can see, mercenary, I can have four guards, archers, and cav in every single one of these armies. So it's a very strong functionality of Sun John, but he isn't necessarily limited by his character classes. Hopefully that helped out, Andreas. Let me know if it didn't. Do you think? Do I think that three K will be a great esports title like Total War Warhammer? I don't think so. I think Total War Warhammer just has more unit diversity for every single race so it plays itself a little bit more into a spectator style of uh, online competitive play and since there's so much variety you can get a lot different kind of interaction uh, this game is very character driven versus very army driven um so did the I just reached the point where I ooh, where I declared myself emperor. So did two other kingdoms. Yeah, when you declare yourself emperor, two other kingdoms will declare themselves emperor, and you'll be kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. Um, I don't have nearly the military the military power to take on two of the three or two of the three campaign map. Two of, take on two of the three of the on the campaign map. Any tips? My tip would be to focus on one and have the other one uh, focus on the one closest to you. Because that third one is either going to focus on the other one, or maybe you. Just basically kind of do it by proximity. Um, and some they're, they're all going to be at war with each other. They can't necessarily... They can ally against you, but it's very hard for them to do that for the AI. Unless one of them is Sao Sao, they can use credibility. But kind of focus on which one you think is going to benefit you directly and immediately to help you cascade into the next one. Might just be the early game, but it feels like giving characters positions is more expensive and upkeep than the benefits it provides. Should you wait or do it anyway for the experience and satisfaction? Uh, Nils, you'll find out that you have to do it very quickly. In fact, if you can, I would get this reform almost immediately. Eunuch secretary, eunuch secretaries, so you can get an administrator position. Um, administrators are so beneficial to your faction, 
And for the most part, you don't always start off with a ton of characters. Like, looking at my army here. Um, some of these guys are going to be pretty pissed off at me. Yeah, she wants a, she wants a, and she's going to leave me next turn, dude. She wants a higher core position. Um, I think Lady Wu does too. Yeah, wants a higher core position. Cheng Pu, I know, does. Yeah, so it's like you need to balance out your core positions with your available characters. And so it's a very kind of um, fine line you have to walk between having characters to do assignments and having characters to be in office. So you have to, in the, characters in office can still do assignments. Not administrators, though, so be mindful of that. Um, so what I would say, though, is administrators are very strong positions, and so are chancellors. So getting them up and running fast is crucial, but making sure you also have characters that can run assignments for you. I think someone asked me how you run assignments. Um, you simply click the commander you have in mind, click assignments, and you should have a list here. You'll only start off with one assignment. Uh, there are ancillaries, there are skills, there are reforms, there are um, faction positions that unlock more assignments. But that's how you would do them. <laughs> Alternatively, you can say like, okay, I've got two assignments. I'll issue one in uh, Zhongling and I'll issue one in Changsha. So it just depends on what you want to do. Crazy C4, how are you doing, my dude? Guys, we only have 25 likes. Come the fuck on. Now, we've been doing this for an hour. I didn't realize that. Oh, let's just bounce this better. This is going to be bounced better. This is terrible lighting. Even now, it looks like shit. A little ambient Latin in there. After a battle, you have reinforcements also and take replenishment off. Does that replenishment go to reinforcements also or main army main army only? I believe it's main army only, and it doesn't stack tickets. So if you were to like run through five armies like real quick in a row, they usually don't stack. I've noticed that, and I found that quite frustrating because it, it can stack in a lot of other games. Um, there were some some questions about battles. So let's load in Matung because I think he's right next to people are going to start war with him. I agree with you, Michael Rincon. I think that I have um, warmed up to the battles. I did not like the battles as much initially. Video for the Yellow Turban playstyle? I can do that. Um, I'm in a pretty shitty predicament in this. Ah! In this campaign, I have Lu Bu about to just burst through my butt over here. He's got Zhang Liao, the Heavenly Dragon General. And that's just not looking good for me. But, I've got Macau over here. I've got uh, Ma Tung right there. And this is kind of shitty army. I mean, he does have a lot of uh, crosswomen, though. That's something to worry about. Oh man, my last name is a doozy, dude. I, I know some last name trials and tribulations, trust me. Do you view any coalitions? Uh, go to diplomacy. Faction grouping. This button in the lower right. You see that hard style lamb? So I can see the coalition of the Yellow River, Liu Bei, Dong Min, and the Han Empire. Which is fucking terrifying. So we'll end this turn and we'll go into a fight, hopefully. We'll see what Lu Bu's gonna do. Just gonna fucking wave his magic stick at me. Oh, oh. Well, this isn't even worth showing you stuff on the can on the battle map, so we'll delegate.
Yeah, he uh, definitely took on Ding quite easily. Let it be known. There's the second army moving in over there. Like They're looking to do some power moves over here, those fucks. So who had questions about the battle before I jump in on this? Trying to think of who I want, would like to put a sentinel in the army. Do you need to attach units to General's Command button or just have them near? Just have them near Spirit Moon. I do not think the three characters uh, retinue system would work in Warhammer 3. Look, my trade! Uh, do you need to attach it? Alright, Daniel, have a good one, dude. Thanks for joining in. Alright, Michaelson, we'll jump into a battle here and I'll show you how I kind of go about it. Uh... Christopher, I don't know how to answer that question. They're kind of unique to each individual. Oh, you son of a bitch! You've baited me! Bait and masturbation switch! So, we're doing a not smart move here. We're going to move Macau over here to the Wudu skill, uh, so trader. Um, you can see that he gets a mustering bonus. Um, in the city. So we're going to move him out, unfortunately. We went from three turns to six turns. But we'll get a fight here going for you guys so we can talk about uh, the battle map for you. Lost on Ding. That's okay. We didn't even have the portions of the commandery anyway. Bitch, it's sneaky fucking son of a bitch. Man. Save this real quick. I'm trying to go in the direction to get you guys a fight as fast as possible here. Oh, of course, you would go back to the lumber yard. Okay. Um. Uh, we'll do this quick save. This quick save should hopefully be a fight. Is keeping your specific group commander near their own troops provide morale only to them? It's uh, it's to the to the army as a whole. Um, Josh, it depends. Oh, that's not fun. Too easy. I'm trying to get like a fight that's like, oh yeah, this will blank. What is this? This is a large town.
Alright, Major Miller, have a good one, dude. Um, Michael Rincon, I would say you always want to have an assignment. I'm sorry, an office over an assignment, but the assignments are really, really good benefits. You have to really kind of look at what's going to give you the long-term benefit. I think that a lot of the times you get a lot of benefits from assignments over positions, depending on... Ah, good! Oh, yeah, we beat the shit out of this guy already, but... Um... This will at least show you guys how I group stuff, how I approach fighting things. Um, oh, oh, excuse me, sorry so much. One question has been asked quite a bit. Is, hey, I don't really like this style. Uh, press escape. Go to interface, uh, alternative unit cards. I already have that on. Um, but unit category sorting. Click that. And it's back to like the standard Warhammer, st or, uh, um, well, Warhammer, but Total War style of your important characters, your heroes, your generals on the left, all the rest of your characters. I kind of like this way though. So what I will do is, let me take all my units and bring them over here so that you can see. Uh, what's your opinion on using all three leaders of an army to gang an enemy general without duels? Um, it can be pretty dangerous, depending on what they are, Keegan. I mean, I wouldn't want my strategists and commanders to go um, try and dumpster a champion. The champion will win, even if it's three on one versus like three strategists. So, I mean, all three of these characters are combat characters. They they are good at being up in front and personal. They're all a little wounded, but that's okay. So, what I would typically do, I would more often than not keep my sentinel back. Um... In this case, I would take my champion, my vanguard, and then all of my cav, and put them together. We'll group them as uh, control group three. Then my infantry, minus my archers, we'll put in control group one. All that line, we're all set. And then my archers, I'll put in control group two. This was Warhammer. I would say do this in case they get compromised. Um, and then I always take my archers off of toggle fire at will, and I always put them on guard mode. So this is pretty much. I got pretty wasted this weekend, so I'm a little slow. <laughs> is there best? But is it best to stack the main city agriculture, that are depending on the village? Yes, yes. Um, your peasantry and all that should be benefit or your. Um, Main city to, should be dependent upon what you have access. So, this is my army. This is kind of a standard format of how I attack things. I'll usually keep these guys on like a wild flank, like all the way out here. And I'm, this is actually a really shitty battlefield. So, putting them in the center of all this is going to be very hard because my archers won't be able to do much through all of this. Uh, What's it called? All these all this foliage, all the all the trees. So be mindful of that for one. Two, I use these guys as a hammer and anvil. It's just a typical approach I'll take. You can oblique uh, thrust or whatever it's called and overload one flank and then cascade down the, the line, whatever makes sense. But this is what I'll typically do. I don't actually even worry too much about where certain things are. I know I probably should have my spears in the flanks, and then everything else in the center, but I don't really worry about that as much in this game. Then I'll start this battle. This is not good. I can't see shit. I'll be honest with you, I probably should have started over here. They would have had to come to me. But, got forward a little bit. I never, I, I know I talked about locking, but I never lock my, uh, my groups. Because it's just the way I like to play. And you have to really be careful of uh, 
the Archer General in here. I don't remember remember his name off the top of my head. He will fuck you up. I don't even know where this army is. Uh, this is this demonstration has gone to shit. <laughs> I mean, I'm losing, like, fatigue on all my guys. <laughs> Aha, here they are. Yeah, this guy will do a shit ton of damage. Like, if he hits any of these guys, he's got an ability on... Oh, I can't show you. He's got an ability that does a crap ton of damage. So the general rock, paper, scissors of the game is that archers beat infantry, infantry or spearmen, for example, beat cav, cav beats archers. That's kind of the general rock, paper, scissors. Of course, there's certain units that will beat infantry that are infantry. There's certain units of cav that'll beat other cav and certain units of archers that will beat other archers. So yes, be mindful of those, those, uh, those overlaps. Like for instance, spear cav will do very well against other cav. Um, versus, like, say, their their uh, sword and shield counterparts, or spear infantry will destroy calves. So you just be mindful of those things. I like small regiments of elite units. Like here, we'll bring all this. This whole force should be able to just rip through these guys pretty easily. And I like to... Oh! Diversify your targets a little bit too. We'll take our these guys here and attack them. Sunsa is... is oh, he's at full health, my bad. I mean, we already killed the enemy general. We'll pull back though. I don't want to get you nuked out, nuked apart. I always... Make sure you keep fucking general with your army like I did not. So we were talking about this a little bit earlier. So you press duel here and they don't want to duel. You can shut off the ability to duel here. Oh, where is it? There it is. I'm actually reject any proposed duels. But... I'll wait for Sunset's little dialogue box to leave. Okay. So, see how it says win a duel for him? Yeah, it says win a duel for him, too. That means he's so... Like, he's... Their strength to him is negligible. When it's usually either overmatched or about equal, it'll typically say last in the duel for up to a certain amount of time. And those doing those objectives will net you certain benefits. So taking a look here. For Huang Zhong, uh, win before a minute 30 to gain the following effects. 25% hit points, the unit, permanent, plus 50 morale, alliance, 180 seconds. Alliance is all of the allied units on the field. So if you have uh, people that are joining you from reinforcements. And then win outside target time effects, you just get the 25% uh, hit points to the unit, permanent. Um, so... 
Um, using these kind of to your advantage is very beneficial. And also being mindful of who you're dueling. So let's say you're fighting three members that are all the same family. If you were to kill one of them, and all and they all look at like they're like negligible in strength. If you're to kill one of them, usually it's gonna bolster their 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 stats by like forty or fifty percent. Like family members fallen, they're berserk. They're very 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 hard to kill at that point. I made that mistake and sent Matung to kill someone. He killed someone. Then I sent my champion to kill uh, another character. The champion got murked because they had such a huge stat bonus because they watched a family member die. So don't just throw heroes in duels because, oh, I'm a champion. That's a strategist. I'm going to win, especially against Yellow Turban. Yellow Turban do not have the same class characteristics as other factions. They only have three classes, veterans, healers, and scholars, and they're a combination of combat and non-combat classes. Either little circle. I think, um, I think the healer is a combination of a sentinel and a commander. I think it's purple and yellow. I can't remember. Um, the veteran, I think, is a combination of a vanguard. Actually, it might be vanguard and... Um, I think it's red and green. I think it might be vanguard and champion. And then the scholar is a strategist. And... Might also be a commander. Or might also be a sentinel. But... When you're doing yellow turban, make sure you're aware of that. Because... Usually, if you join the Yellow Turban, you fall into, like, their family, and killing one of them in battle, like, it's just fucking turbulent. So watch these things and make sure they don't have any static benefits that are going to completely kill your character off. You have to be super mindful of that. Uh... Kill that guy. So this character, let's say I want him in my faction. Oh, 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 that would have really fucking hurt him so bad. Um, you can tell what kind of duel it's going to be if you do duel. They'll say the objective is to kill or wound. We'll, we'll swarm this guy. Okay. We knocked him off of his horse. And we'll just go ahead and wrap this up. I mean, this is to show you how strong my weakened cavalry force was against their weakened um, infantry force. But I beat the whole army just using my cav, really. You can rematch it if you didn't like the outcome. You got, you got some options here. So when you end that battle, though, I believe we didn't kill anyone. And I'll show you an indicator here. Because we've already fought this uh, war with these guys, and we have killed a lot of these characters already. So we killed this character. We captured these two. And you can see here, uh, resilience. So some of you asked, like, hey, how do I know if a character is going to die or not? Um, when you hover over my, my, my healthy characters, resilience. This, they are uninjured and raring for battle. Resilience is how wounded your character is from battle. Wounds will heal over time. So I have now killed uh, Liu Biao and I've killed uh, Huang Zhang, the ageless strength. So his resilience is weakened. His wounded, he was wounded in battle. He's got three turns left. They have suffered serious injuries from battle. Any further injury may have fatal consequences. So, it's not guaranteed, but you're probably going to lose them if I were to fight this battle again and I were to win. So, let's just go ahead and uh, we'll ransom them. Whatever. Oh, that's interesting. Well, when you get in those, those fights, let me actually reload that quick save. If I ever find it, I'm a fucking god. Uh, 
Do you prefer to use a large army of peasants or a small? I uh, answered that, Misha. Why it's so dark? Alright, it's probably because I keep leaning all over the place. So, this is the percentage chance of capturing these characters. See? Like, I've got 0% chance of capturing Liu Biao. But I really want Huang Zhang in my military. I've only got a 35% chance of capturing him. So if it's a decisive victory, of course that is increased. But he has an 8% uh, chance to escape, lowering it totally to a 35%. Same thing here. You can see he's got a 66% escape chance, um, over outweighing my capture chance. So, um, same thing. He last. It's his, he's on his last wound, so he's very easy to capture at that point. Um, to capture characters, you typically have to break their morale. If you wound them on the battlefield. Oftentimes they won't be capturable. It just depends on the scenario, I think. Um, and the resilience. Hey, Vu Dong Hai, how are you? So, uh, I think if I delegate this, let me delegate this and see what happens. Dead. Yes. You can you can get items that increase your chance to... Um, here, let's go... I think if I press Ransom, it automatically releases. Nope, 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 doesn't matter. Ransom won't matter. So if I were to click Ransom, it wouldn't matter in that case as far as seeing the, the characters. Guys. I got a plumber coming, so one second I gotta go. Give me one second. Let me go uh, make sure that the cats are inside.
Bailey takes over the streams all the time. Okay. Well, let me see if I missed anything here. Hopefully this has been informative for you guys. I've just been kind of rambling here. Um, yes, you can get items that increase your ad odds of capturing. Also, your odds of escaping. Uh, if, you just, if I destroy Liu Biao, can I get Jing Infantry and later Imperial Defenders? Are you talking about his specific faction infantry? Uh, Vudong Hai. There, there are the uh, the Emperor, the Imperial units you'll always be able to get. We heard some die, but when I went to take back to next turn, they had 100% finished. That's weird, Tim. They should have a, a stage in which they uh, they go through. I think this is a recently. Nope. It should have a stage in which it will replenish its garrison after it's been recently attacked. <laughs> I'm doing good, Jalen. How are you, dude? The Akata Samu, you like my uh, rambling, huh? Thank you. <laughs> Any advice on starting a new Gong Zon Zon campaign? Um. New one? How do you play him? He's how do I play da, Dong Zhuo? He's uh, super hard being surrounded. Uh, Ash, my tip to you would be wait, let's go put to menu. Here, I'm not Spartacus the Rambler. Alex the Rambler is one of the coolest people I've ever met. Um. Tyrant. So Dong Zhuo starts here, obviously. My advice to you would be to shore up your allies, right? Like, push back this direction. Ma Tung, you can get really close with. Stay that way. Don't expand this way, because all of your enemies are going to come from this direction. Uh, my advice would be not to dabble with those bros. And, okay. Uh, would not be to dabble with any of them. Just stick as close as you can to the main central regions you already have solidified and keep them that way. Um, the more you spread out in this direction and try to maintain it, you're going to be you're going to be dealing with forces from the north, from the northeast, from the east, from the southeast. Like just stay here, shore back this way. Like Ma Tung will, will ally with you pretty easily. You know, staunch defender of Han and the emperor under my protection, a staunch ally of mine. So you can get him quickly. Uh, Gong Du and Ma Tung can fight and fight, so you don't have to really worry about it as much. Um, but you do want to eventually push out Gong Du because he can expand pretty rapidly if he knocks out Ma Tung. But again, I, I would say uh, really shore up this direction and go back towards here. This way your back is to nothing, and you can then create a power base to then move down through. If you think about it, if you were to take one, two, three, four, five, you'd pretty much have this whole region. One, two, Turin's coming for you. Three, four, he at your door. Thanks for the donation, Turin. A wide two dollars will help me substantially as I put more money towards kidnapping you. Um, when you pick up, pick up party. Good to hear, Michael. Glad I could be of help, man. Um, as far as Gong Sun Zan, I mean, you. I don't remember how the Lubu stuff works, Rod. Um, I only I only played Dong Zhuo for a little bit. I didn't get stuck too much on him, to be totally honest. Um, the nice thing with Gong Sun Zan is that he doesn't ha his back is to here. So once you take this thing from the Han Empire, th this, uh, this portion, you're pretty much shored up in this direction. You just have to push this way. Um, this guy, I believe, starts kind of at war with you. Um, Yuan Shuao, you can go immediately into war with and just kind of destroy. Uh, Huang Shuao is also going to be an issue for you as well. But really, for the most part, Gong Sun Zan is about expanding these directions and then moving down. The further west you go, the more you're going to have to deal with uh, Zheng Jiang. So be mindful of that. You don't want to get too much up in her face. Uh, but Gong Sun is, is very... Isn't it Gong Sun Zan? Gong Sun Zan? Is it, is, it's like a duh, isn't it? 
Um, but he's got a lot of really cool uh, cav benefits, 12% armor for all shot cav, shot cav. He himself is a vanguard. He, south, he starts with Zhao Yun, who's a fucking really strong sentinel. You have a really good power base as uh, Gong Sun's on. I really like Gong Sun. You, uh, you want Xiao and his army of vassals. Uh, get, they're going to be fixing that soon, so I'd wait. You get the Tyrant campaign. Josh Dale, you get the Tyrant campaign by uh, beating the campaign. If you absolutely cannot beat the campaign, I will give you guys a save, in which case you would do this and you become Emperor at the end of the turn. Oh. <sighs> Have problems when going up. They come toward. They come towards me below, and I get wrecked. From Yuan Shu. Yeah. Um, Yuan Shu is going to be a problem for you. So, like I said, I would even just abandon this commandery. Let them. Let them fight it out. In fact, you can manually fight these battles so that you can whittle their army away. That you can then like kind of have your last line of defense right here. I'm playing as Gong Sun Zan with six commanderies. Suddenly, my neighbor Yuan Shuao also has six commanderies. Vassalizes Kong Rong, Liu Bei, who have the same strength. Any idea on how that happened? I'm quite confused. There was no war between them, and it doesn't seem logical to any. Uh, Julian, right now it is a um, a bug that Yuan Shuao can vassalize so easily. So that'll be fixed soon. Expansion diplomacy tips with any campaign. Some general expansion or diplomacy tips. Um. Jalen, give me one second, and we'll jump back into a campaign to talk about that. Um, Michael Rincon asked, are garrisons really weak to you? I feel I can't rely on them like I could in Warhammer. They start out very weak, but even level two of your um, settlements, Michael, makes them very strong. Most things can't deal with level two. Uh, I can defeat a full stack of militia bullshit with a uh, level two uh, settlement quite easily. Uh, where's my Gong Sun's on camp? Oh, there you go. It's this is a pretty big old fat region, right? I prefer romance. I'm a hopeless romantic, Ash. You know, it's just nice walk on the beach. Yeah, I have minor problems for the campaign, but I have problems with switching campaigns all the time. I started six or more and finished none. Josh, uh, that's fine. The game just came out, man. I mean, look at me, dude. I got Liu Bei. I've got Yuan Shuo, uh, my Sun Juan one. I got a Sao Sao one. My Sao Sao one fucking sucks. I need to redo that one. I'm Ma Tung. I mean, just try them all out. See what you really like the play style of, and then just go crazy. Uh, you don't have to finish it. Do you know that? Like, I've been playing Total War games since I was like fucking twelve when Rome Total War came out. I've never beaten a Rome Total War one, two. Shogun, Empire, Campaign. I've beaten, the only campaigns I've beaten are Warhammer 1 and 2. No, I haven't beaten in 2. I have not beat a, a campaign in 2. I just like to play a lot of campaigns. And the early portion of the game is so, so fun for me. It's the same thing with like a, a GTA games. I didn't, I haven't finished a GTA in years. <laughs> yeah, I've never beaten Shogun 2. I've beaten campaigns, just not in two, in Total War Warhammer 2. So, Crisps, that's going to be the objective of the new Warhammer uh, stream we're going to start, is to beat Total War Warhammer 2 campaign. What would That deals with archers, Ash? So you're asking the best faction that has archers at their disposal, or the best faction to fight archers? The best faction that um, gets archers would be Liu Bei. He gets both the Yi Archers and the Yi Marksmen. What's up, Mr. Wolf? Gong Sun Zan gets some nice uh, horse archers. Doesn't one of the governors get really good archers too? No, it's not Mon Tung. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kong Rong also gets uh, Thunderer of Jian Tin or Jian An. 
and Fury of uh, Beihai. I'm good, dude. How are you, brother? Good to see you, man. It's been some time. It's very hard, Hans Christensen. It's not for me. I don't really like Dong Zhuo in general, so I do not play it. What's my favorite faction? Um, these two. Oh, my game just crashed. Uh oh. Yeah, game just crashed. Okay. Um, my favorite factions are Liu Bei and Sun Jian. Have you ever played against Tom and Wheels? Um, no. I know, Mountain. I've been going. I've been going hog wild over here. I got about fifteen more minutes, though. I do want to work on some uh, quick battles to put up on the channel. Uh, I'm trying to finish the Skulls for Skull Throne tournament so we get that up there. Yes, uh, Chris made a really good observation. Uh, it's so much harder to snowball in Three Kingdoms, and that was an intention. So Liu Bei, uh, one of my favorite factions. He has a really fun start. Uh, Weapon Master 470 was like, hey, you should do a uh, Liu Bei campaign where your objective is to go south and east as fast as possible. So that's what I'm going to do. Liu Bei, Liu Bei, I know. Oh, I get you fucking son of a bitch. Now I get it. You tricky, you tricky man bastard. When do you think they will add DLC or mods? Uh, mods pretty soon, probably, Ash. Uh, DLC, I would imagine after the next Warhammer DLC, we'll, we'll see probably the first this DLCs. Hmm. All right. The top guys for beginners, Misha... Uh, Liu Bei, Liu Bei, uh, Liu Bei and Sun Jian, I think, are easiest for, for beginners. Cao Cao is certainly not. Uh, Gong Sun Zan is also very, uh, he's easier for, uh, for, for beginners because he himself is so strong and his, uh, characters are so strong and he's got very little competition up here. But I think he's very strong. The uh, Yuan Shuo is pretty difficult. Well, not difficult. He's just he's got a lot of aspects to him. Shu is very hard, I think, in my opinion. I think this is very correct. Uh, the governors are difficult as a whole. Ma Tung is extremely difficult. Uh, Liu Biao has got just so little to start with and so much opposition to start with that it's it's difficult for him to get momentum. Uh, Kong Rong is not that difficult, but he's uh, it's hard because he's in between a lot of very strong characters. Liu Bei starts right here, Yuan Shuo is here, and Gong Sun Zan's here. So uh, Liu Bei can can expand up this in like five, ten turns because it's all Han Empire. He can use Unity to uh, annex it all very quickly. So it's hard for Kong Rong to get a foothold in the world, I think. I know you're wrapping up. What's the best way to deal with an archer-heavy army? Um, best way to deal with archer-heavy army is cavalry. Put the cavalry force into two separate forces and have them go opposite directions, opposite directions, and then down. Or just have them just smash into things as they're going. Like, basically, you want to use the, the, the characters, the, the cavalry forces that are being targeted, have them keep running, and use your other forces to smash into the rear of uh, Archer Heavy Army. And you use your infantry to, to tie up their infantry while you, uh, while you smash into the sides with your cav. You can even use your cab to charge right down the center, then pull them through into the archers if they're depending on their their medium or heaviness, their weight. That's a good point, Keegan. With the current like kind of imbalance from his um his ability to what's it called um his ability to. Confederate, uh, he can be pretty easy, but that will be fixed probably in the next day or two.
Uh, Vudong High, that's supposed to be changing soon with the chapters. Lineage, yes. Auto-resolve battle mechanic, is it fair? Mountain, it is never fair. <laughs> um, my opinion, if you're going to use auto-resolve, do it when you have an overwhelmingly huge force to a small force. Even in battles where you're fighting against an enemy and you are defending a, like a town, fight it. Fight it, fight it, fight it, fight it, fight it. You can use the towers to destroy the generals so fast. Like, four or five volleys and that general should be just about dead and you can use your garrison to mop up the general. Then you've killed their leadership. Like, all you really have to do is just hold your towers and you can, you can fight an overwhelming force in a uh, town. What character type is the best in melee versus infantry? A vanguard? Yes, Nils, I would say a vanguard. Although a champion can do very well as well. Um, I just think champions are more geared towards one-on-one uh, -on -one combat. Is Cav going to get nerf? As, as it is, Cav is super OP right now. Um, It just depends, Get It just depends on what the defense of the... Uh, or what the uh, the army's construction, construction looks like. Uh, lighter and medium Cav can't do much against heavy infantry. Well, they can, but they... Harder for them to move through. There's more weight to them. Roman stuff. Uh, very little, Josh. Uh, there's the the story of the lost legion, but that's like over here. <laughs> Where kids and legendary lords get some of their romance type mechanics. What do you mean, Nicholas? The chance of seeing zero. I agree with crisps. Um, oh, uh, someone asked me about sterile marriages. I don't really know on that, to be totally honest. Is that what they're looking at changing? Uh, no, Keegan, I'll show you. Allow me to show you Keegan Smith. Wasn't there something else I was supposed to be showing on the campaign map that I didn't show? Let me scroll up. Julian, didn't you have a question about something? Yeah, Matung pops out kids like no one's business. But here's my... Uh, you want trial campaign, which I think is a bad situation. Hmm. Um. Ah. I I looked up how to pronounce his name and I can't remember now. And like. Tai Sosa or something. Tai Shusa. Uh, was okay. okay, so right now, this motherfucker. Let me see. It's easier for me to do things as a result of like lineage and this stuff. But basically he has for some reason a freak innate bonus to this confederation. So confederation can only be done as a king, right? So with Yuan Shuao for some reason he can just cause a, a huge rampant amount of um, confederation and that's the big problem with him right now. Yeah, Josh, that is uh, unintended. That is a bug, and it should be fixed. Uh, Oyakatsu-sama. Uh, in general, yeah, I would never, ever, ever want to have fatigue. It can completely destroy a character. Get to answer your question depends on your faction. 
Uh, Yuan Shu has access to really good infantry on, on his own. But yes, these guys are very strong. The Azure Dragons are, are just like uh, Lo Lothern Seaguard. They've got arch they've got bows, and on top of it, they've got glaives. So they do a lot of damage, a lot of AP damage to uh, units. So I really, really, really like them as far as infantry units go. Um, but you've also got Pearl Dragons. These guys are light glaive infantry. Then you've also got the Yellow Dragons, which are light axe infantry. So those guys are all very good. I just think I like these guys because I like things that are um, that have multiple roles. Bug with three. Uh, all of it, Josh. He shouldn't have three stacks. He shouldn't be declaring war on you that quickly. He shouldn't be um, confederating that fast. A uh, mountain. Some guy just made a really, really, really good Reddit post. Um, let me get that post for you. Oh, there it is. This is a pretty solid post. There you go. Gosh, I'm glad, dude. I'm glad to hear that it's helping you out, brother. Um, alternatively, and we all know how guarded I am about my, about our, uh, Discord. If you have any other questions after this stream, there's the link to the Discord. You can go ahead and join that. It'll be active for the next 24 hours. So if you watch this in retrospect, you can jump on. You can feel free to direct message me, ask questions in general chat. Um, everyone there is extremely helpful. They'll be able to help you out if I'm not available. But currently doing first one is Liu Bei, and Liu Bu decided he wanted to be hired at around turn 15. So I feel mega OP. Yeah, Christopher, don't don't fuck with that. That's a good. That's good, bro. I wouldn't touch that. <laughs> My Liu Bei one, Wu has about half the map too, which I had no idea about until it became Vassal. Yeah. Uh, Confederating is extremely strong, Hair Trigger. Liu Bei can really, can be strong, can be hard, but he also can be, uh, he also can be very strong. So let's go ahead, my Liu Bei campaign. What are you doing? What? Guys, it's Bailey time. It's Bailey time. So good. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Vudong. I know you just want to come and sit under my arm the entire time. So if you do get lost, press F2. Oops, capture. Press F2. And all these videos should help you for the most part. Um General strategy, army stances, I mean, it's me voicing it too. Moving your army across the campaign map is integral to any good general's you battle hear. plans. Your general will always start in so, the normal stance. if you do get lost, no bonuses. feel free to use the resources that are available to you. Um, like, let's say in, in specific, I'm playing Liu Bei. I don't really understand what the fuck this all means. Right click this, and here's an example of how currency works. Liu Bei's faction resource is so, unity, as the I'm always gonna be there to help you out. <laughs> really, you are just the hottest breathing dog right now. Um. 
Yeah, it's totally easier than Sun Jian. Or than Ma Tung. Uh, I'll switch all the voiceovers to you, right? Yeah. Oh, if you guys want to know how to do that, escape, game settings. Ooh, nope. Mm, nope. Audio. And I have Chinese audio diplomacy, voiceover, and advisor speech all set. And I click show subtitles. It makes the game like 10 times more fun. Okay, so this is Liu Bei. This is turn 10? Turn 11. You start right here as Liu Bei. I, lost, I got the Dong mine. And then I just went all the way up here and I just annexed all of this. This is what I was saying. Like, I can now annex this portion right here. I think the farm, I think the city is like right here. Yeah, the city is right there. So, I mean, Liu Bei can have two commanderies well within two of his allies right from the start of the game if you just kind of play it right. Then your big objective after that is really defending and fighting off against Cao Cao because he's going to be putting a lot of aggression on uh, uh, Tao Qian. You have to really kind of get him down here. That's why he's already moving in this direction to kind of help uh, head off this pass. Also, you do have to deal with uh, Huang Shao as well, so be mindful of that. I wish I knew Mandarin as well, Vu Donghai. I just, I've looked up pronunciations enough, so I try to sound at least like I know what I'm talking about. And once you learn like certain little things about pinyin, it's easier, like uh, the way certain things are pronounced. Like Q is a CH sound. But then again, there's like the rules for that sometimes being different. But taking Kong Rong and Yuan Shua would be a good idea. As Liu Bei? Uh, no, you, because what you can do is. I can unify. Like, he's not going to take this right now. So I would prefer not to war with an ally or two people that are easily going to be my allies, like Kong Rong and Tao Chan. And instead, I'd rather use unify. Like, right now I can't do it, but as I go about and help them out with their war, I will be able to unify with Tao Chan and take this whole entire portion. Um, of course, the, the problem with that is that uh, Dong Hai is already split with Han Empire, which is like, I think it's right here. So I can then annex that. Like, honestly, you can do a lot of different things with Liu Bei. That's what I like about him so much. Yeah, because uh, remember, Gong Sun Zan starts right here. And he just has this to his back to destroy, and once he does that, you kind of have this whole region to yourself. You would think Ma Tung would be easy, seeing as though he starts like right here. And this is all Han, but it's, it's not like that. It's actually really, really, really hard. So, I think that's going to kind of answer the majority of the questions here. Do you guys have any other questions that I missed? Please feel free to ask them right now. Um, if you're watching this in retrospect and you missed the ability to ask any questions, please go ahead and ask them in the comment section and I will get to them as fast as I can. I took the weekend off just to kind of recharge from stuff. So I have to answer a bevy of questions on the, the guide. So I'll get to those as fast as I can. Um, do I feel like they're OP? No, I feel like they're in line with their characters. Uh, the question was, do you feel like the starting weapons for Liu Bei and Guan Yu are OP? I can get 1500 kills on just the heroes alone in romance. Yeah, uh, like again, I, especially Guan Yu, right? He's supposed to be the, uh, the god of war. Oh, there it is right there. And I feel like they're very in line with the, the amount of damage that you're supposed to get from these guys. They don't start with a settlement. They start with just armies. So you need them to be the really strong characters that they are. Can I explain the reinforcement mechanics? Uh, Fuak Trong, let me go about that as best as I can. So the reinforcement mechanic as in when you get into a fight or when you are talking about replenishment. How do you unify fast with other factions as Liu Bei? Uh, Fenrir, to do that, you have to just kind of be involved in their situations so 
Prince and Sot. How Chion is going <laughs> to... Yeah, he just looks at me like, oh my god, don't, don't look at me. Um, for Tao Chian, I'm going to go get down to this war over here. I'm going to help him out. It's going to give me benefits in our relationship together. Because it's dependent upon your attitude. What? Uh, do I not have desktop sound? I do not have desktop sound right now. Um, ch -ch 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 -ch. Where am I looking for? Oh. Yeah, no sound. Did I click it off or something? Look at me. So stupid. 69. So, um, I'm going to diplomacy, looking at Tao Chian. He currently is very satisfied with me. So, having a lot of unity, being bigger than him, recent positive events involving us, like, those things will help you increase the likelihood in which you can unify together, and once you do, you get them. Uh, can you kind of briefly go over it? When, when should I be recruiting a next second army, and should I be leaving one behind? Bend. Um, Josh, if you jump to the very beginning of this video, you should see it around the 20-minute uh, mark. Uh, when fighting, I have units next to each other, but only one fight. Uh, you have to see if, yeah, um, so you, you see this, this is like your reinforcement aura. If they're right next to each other, then yeah, they should be able to reinforce. But there might be issues where they're allies and they won't jump in with you. Uh, the enemy might have something that prevents you from having them reinforce. There's some factors that could prevent reinforcement. Uh, que sera, sera. Different types of commanders get different types of units. How do I know which which gets which? For example, crossbows for strategists. I, did you, I feel like you just answered that question, que sera, sera. Like, crossbows for strategists, any type of infantry in your champion. Um, Sentinels as well get different types of infantry. Your vanguards get your cav, while well, some on your uh, commanders as well. It depends on what you want. Uh, you can always right-click a character. And you'll see what gets what. Go to military. You'll see how to like access Yi Marksman, for example. Same thing with this character. Uh, your unique faction ones will always be special units they can unlock. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Kisra. I thought... Does that, does that help? I, I feel like I kind of dismissed that question. Oh, and the reform tree? Reform tree. So, again, uh, color coordinated for the most part. Azure Dragons will be green. Pearl Dragons will be um, purple. Your Heavy Repeating Crossbowmen will be on your Strategists. Your Yellow Dragons will also be purple. Your Mounted Archers will be on Strategists, I believe. I think that also is Vanguard, I'm not sure. But it's typically coordinated with their color. So Jade Dragons will always be on your Vanguard, for example. Um, but just, yeah, look at the color of them. G Infantry should replace G Militia. So anyone who can take them could replace them. Same thing with G Heavy Infantry. Some things replace units. So um, Saber Infantry, for example, will replace your Saber Militia. Oh, there's the Onyx Dragons. Looking for those guys. Uh, where's the sword, dude? There they are. So your Sabre Cat, your Sabre Cat will replace your Sabre Militia, so on and so forth. Hi, Mohammed. How are you? Axe Band will replace your Axe Militia. Peasant Bands are their own unit. Spear Warriors are again their own unit. Ooh. 
Big stretch. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely, Vudong. More than happy. More than happy to uh, help out, brother. If you guys have any other questions, though, please go ahead and ask in the comment section of this video. Um, I have to get to all the questions that on the uh, the guys that I haven't gotten to just yet. I'll be getting to those. In the next couple days, we'll be seeing some uh, 40k lore, a stream on Warhammer Fantasy, a some quick battles, some Warhammer Fantasy lore. I got shit, tons of shit planned. You've done a reform guide. I have not, Movie Man, Brad. Um, I just... I, I feel like that's kind of like... The reforms all have necessary things for them. So the big thing about the reforms is it just should be dependent upon your commandery that you're that you're in right now, the units you want to focus. There's there's so little actual reforms you absolutely 100% need. Um, I think that uh, the eunuch secretaries is one of uh, is a go-to one because that way you get uh, administrators right off the bat. You don't have to wait until you become a marquee, a second marquee. Um, foreign envoys, um, envoys can be good if you have a lot of trade available to begin with. This expands your trade right out the gate. But for the most part, these should all be dependent upon the kind of campaign you're running, not necessarily a min-maxing. Near the game, but at the, at the end, I have difficulties moving armies together across the map. Um, Mohammed, do you mean on the campaign map or in the battle map? Do the color codes in Calvary mean anything? I put my Lancer cab with my champions. Is there any synergy bonuses besides archers with cunning characters? Um, um, it depends on the character. Don't shoot niacin. Okay, how much fucking niacin I take in a day, bro? Do you know fucking how much money I Or how, how much fucking niacin I take, bro? So fucking much. <laughs> if the tingles right now just thinking about it. Um, look at the character and determine what makes the most sense. Um, Juan Yu is going to give a lot of really good benefits to spear infantry if he is the prime minister heir or faction leader you have to look at those things too sometimes it'll say own retinue and their skills will then coincide with it as well so while cunning gives a direct ammunition bonus true uh very little will actually give bonuses to other units except for like say authority which gives morale and expertise oh no that's melee evasion for him himself but yeah that's those are the only stats that apply to your army outside of recruitment cost from instinct but your skills will benefit certain characters and, and units. Um, that's when commanding, own retinues, guerrilla deployment. Look at the Vanguard. The Vanguard usually has a lot of stuff for his own retinue. The own retinue plus 25% melee damage for all shock cav. That's when you would want to stack shock cav into Zhang Fei's army because he has passion as a, a skill. So you have to look at the ancillaries and you have to look at the skills you've given your character. And I've not given him any. <laughs> or for instance, this one, uh, Zhang Fei's army enables fatigue immunity for his own retinue. And since he's a vanguard, I would typically fill him with a lot of cav and cav can exhaust their fatigue very quickly. So you can use this to really help out uh, how you're going to build out um, each individual um, retinue. Uh, Mohammed Fo uh, Fauda, I would guess that if you need help moving characters on the campaign map, it's pretty simple. What can, what can I help you out in specific? What what hangs you up the most? I'm playing Sao Sao can't change the faction air. Can I change him or execute him after they grow up, or is it campaign locked? Uh, once they become, um, once the faction air slot is filled, I think the family tree locks it in. Um, if they're a child. But once it becomes a full-grown adult, you should be able to change the faction error um, as long as the general is of a certain um, satisfaction or rank, I believe. You have to do it through here. Oh, I thought it was three. There's a way to do it. It's, it's, a, it's a court action. I can't remember where. You group your hero champ with a different group. Does the direct new tied to him bonuses? Correct, Darren. So, if I were to jump into this battlefield and make it so that this vanguard guy controlled all these units, these five units, the people that would get his own retinue bon benefit would still be these five, even if someone else was next to them. That retinue bonus co applies when he's in the game, not if he's just in range. 
it's that's a it's a bonus that's immediately added to them. So Muhammad, to move them all together, you have to unfortunately click them individually. Um, take the one that is the slowest or the furthest away, move him up, and then have the rest of your armies move next to them. That's the best way to do it. Um, alternatively, you see as you hover over one character, they've got their reinforcement aura. You can basically say that, okay, so if I'm moving three armies together to cover more land, I'm going to make it so that they are touching each other's reinforcement aura. The way that that would work, though, is if one of them gets attacked, only two of them, only one of the, another one would reinforce. So, for instance, if I had a character here and a character here at the edge of Liu Bei's reinforcement aura, um, if this character over here gets attacked, only Liu Bei will be able to reinforce. This character over here gets attacked, Liu Bei will only be the one to reinforce. Liu Bei gets attacked, the other two will reinforce. How do you tell what you need to build in each city? Uh, Ash, just base it off the uh, off which settlements you have in your building, in your commandery. So, uh, for instance, we have a lot of peasantry income from these green buildings. So, eventually, I will swap out. I think I'll swap out the inn. Yeah, I'll swap out the inn because the marketplace gives me trade influence. I'll swap out the inn for government support which will increase my food production, which I'm getting innately from these two, and, well, from this one, and it'll increase my peasantry from, in, or income from peasantry, because these both generate uh, income from peasantry. Well, this one will eventually generate it. If I go into, oh, it's commerce. My fucking bad. This one's strictly food production, but the grain fields or livestock farms typically do both. Hover over this to determine what you should be focusing in. Commerce is um, is big right now, but peasantry will become bigger as a result of what's in my uh, faction. So you, fo you focus on those. Do they gain health as a level? And is there a way to see their HP? Character. Go. There we go. So military. And that's his health. Those are your, that's your character's hit points. Uh, Mawid El Sayed. Mawid. And uh, to increase those hit points, they will increase with their level, but also with resolve. Increasing resolve will increase those. Do you get the other three tiger generals, Zhao Yun, Huang Zhuang, and Macau via event, or do you have to manually recruit them after their faction is destroyed? Thanks in advance. Uh... Sin Zhao BS or Sin X Sin Zhao. You have to recruit them. I believe, though, that if you follow the story, they do come your way, assuming they don't get destroyed beforehand. That? Camera's like, can't focus on me. Of course, I wore a dark short like a moron. To, to repeat that question, I'm sorry, I just realized I didn't do that. Uh, since Albias asked, Hello, as Liu Bei, do you get the other three Tiger Generals, Zhao Yun, uh, Huang Zhong, and Ma Kao, via event, or do you have to manually recruit them after their faction is destroyed? Thanks in advance. Uh, you have to manually recruit them once their faction is destroyed, or I believe that there is a, um event that will trigger them to be recruited if you follow the story. Detailed guide. Ben, I don't have a detailed guide on corruption, unfortunately. You can subvert a lot of corruption uh, using the yellow buildings. There you go. The Grand Judiciary Office will reduce uh, will do will reduce corruption, and this one, the Office for Archives and Seals, will reduce corruption in adjacent commanderies. So you would be using abilities, skills, uh, reforms, like this reform tree I'll show you. One for, yeah. So this, this tree in specific, officer relocation, starting over here with the Bur Bureau of Banditry, will help with public order and with corruption. The two of them will stack to 11% reduction in corruption. 
Um, Sentinels have a lot of abilities that will help out with corruption reduction as well, as far as assignments go. I think they also have skills that help out with public order and a reduction to corruption. Uh, Maweed El Sayed, no. If you destroy a faction, you get to choose amongst the generals they had. You do not. You can only capture what they had available um, if you were got into a conflict with them and you didn't kill them on the battlefield. Otherwise, uh, any general that isn't killed outright will enter the, the global candidate recruitment pool. Yes, uh, Modestro just said assign assignees also have spots for reducing corruption, like 50% reduction. Uh, Fenrir 44, I unfortunately don't know. Absolutely, Sin, uh, Sin Zhao. More than happy to help, brother. Ben B, did that help you out? Did my answer help you out? Ben B's question was on corruption and how to help out with it. That's how, why I went into corruption. Oh man, Song of Craig and Patter. I got bad news, man. We're about to like end <laughs> um, a bit, huh? Okay, so also these will help out with your corruption as well. I think it's the Grand Commandant or Excellency that is corruption focused. I can't remember. Is there any reason it is advised to a garrison armies in your commander? Um, it helps them with, with their replenishment and their mustering mountain. I thought one of these guys helped out with, uh, maybe it's the Prime Minister then that can help out with corruption. The, uh, the Faction Error helps out with corruption. This might be because he has items that do that. Faction Error. Peter. Peter. Double. Factionary. Aha! Hmm. Yeah, that's just, this is position itself then. Where is it best to build military buildings? I don't seem to build them much. Alan Tan, I would build them in your main commandery that you want to recruit all your infantry from. Either spear infantry only get a, a charge resist defense versus mounted and no anti-cab bonuses aside from that, correct? Um, trouble, I believe that the natural inclination of spears. <sighs> helps out with cav. I thought there was a, a specific thing that helped out with Cav, and I can't remember now. There's so much to remember in this game. Um, yes, some spear units can reflect charge damage. That is very correct. You would notice it in this. Yeah, charge reflection versus mounted. Reflects the charge damage of any mounted attacker back onto them when braced. Braced means that they're not moving and facing what's attacking them. Absolutely, Michael. I told, I asked CA if they would do one, so you might actually get an official one from them. When do you truly need the grain farming buildings and where? Uh, Froka, your, your reserves, you should always be producing enough food per turn to fill up your reserves. Because your reserves will increase your military supplies, and as soon as you run out of reserves, you'll start having public order issues. Make your regular characters legendary. Yes, Mawid Al Said, all... Characters can become legendary as soon as they reach 100 in any attribute. For instance, Fulong uh, became 
legendary because he has 112 expertise. And when you become legendary, you gain more resilience and you, you uh, acquire experience faster. Um, some generals have bows by default, but if you want to have a character have a bow, you have to equip them with a composite bow if they don't have a bow by default. Yes, Chris is correct. Uh, reserves also increase the, the holdout time in the event of a siege. Michael, like I said, man, I'm more than happy to do these, brother. Okay. So, I'm going to go... This is now... This has gone two and a half hours. This is pretty beastly. So, I'm going to go ahead and roll the credits here, guys. Um, if you have any other questions that apply to the to Three Kingdoms, um, go ahead and ask them in the in the comment section below. I'm going to try to get to all the questions I can on the, uh, the game guides. I've asked Creative Assembly to do the same exact thing. You hopefully should be able to get one a, a, an official stream from them so that you can um, get this going as well. I, I apologize if I didn't cover your question or I didn't answer it um, succinctly, but Ben B, like I was saying on corruption, just make sure you're looking at reforms, ancillaries, skills, uh, specific characters, commanders and sentinels are gonna be your ones for um, corruption. Um, also, this line of buildings. Oh, well. I'm on this character and this doesn't have a, the reduction to what's it called so sorry the other administration office but guys as always thanks so much for watching uh, absolutely alan tan uh, if you if you missed I, I wish i could timestamp all the questions and answers but it was such a flurry that i was answering so many at so many times that i, I couldn't really kind of keep it cohesive i apologize about that but Guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, have, have any more questions, please go ahead and ask below. Um, if you've got a chance, here is the uh, the Discord link. You can go ahead and join the Discord. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions on that. Uh, Crisps is on the Discord. Misha, Whiskey Jack, and they're all pretty versed in games as well. Uh, Loremaster of Sotex there, Turin. So any questions, we're, we're all pretty available to answer. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.